She was chairperson of Sun Life Financial Philippine Holding Co. and prior to that, CEO of Sun Life Financial Philippines. She is independent director of Ayala Corporation, BPI, First Philippine Holdings Corporation, Universal Rubina Corp., GoTime Bank, MaxiCare Health Corporation, among others. She is one of only a handful of Filipino six stars, runners, who have completed all six of the world marathon majors. With us and thought leaders, please welcome Rizalina G. Mantari. It's so good to see you, Riza. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great to see you again, Kathy, after all these years that we were locked indeed, down. Indeed. And even prior to the lockdown, it's been what, like five years since, mm -hmm. since you stepped down as CEO? That's right. And I think four years since you retired as chairperson. So That's correct. What, That's what's correct. it been like post-retirement? Well, <laughs> to be honest, when I first stepped down as chairperson, I felt a little bit lost. It wasn't that I wasn't busy because I was the president of the Management Association of the Philippines at that time. And yes, I always used to joke that it's like a full-time job. And I was on some other boards like NBC and a couple of other companies. But there's a structure that suddenly disappears. You're used to coming into work every morning. You're used to your routine throughout the day. So you feel a little lost. But then as the months passed and as... You know, I got to end up, ended up doing more and more. People think when you're retired, you have all the time in the world. You know, until it got <laughs> no, it got to the point where my daughter said, "Mom, aren't you supposed to be retired?" Because I couldn't join her for something she wanted mm -hmm. me to join her at. And then you realize that it's just that the structure has changed, but it's actually been really interesting since I retired and uh, and. I guess it's for, for me, it's been a very valuable period. Um, I ended up being on other boards, as, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, and I've, I've seen that it's quite a spread. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's beyond insurance, but also covering perhaps maybe financial inclusion with some digital banking in there, traditional banking. It's the whole spread. The whole spread down all the way to consumer <laughs> products with the URC. And, uh, and that's been really interesting for me too, being on boards. Because your perspective changes when you're crossing multiple industries. I think my experience as an executive of the insurance company has been helpful to me. It's a perspective you bring to the board, particularly risk management, for example, where insurance, that's our strength in the insurance industry. And, the, and that's also become very important these days. And then my background in IT, but at the same time, I was learning from all the boards, learning about the different issues, the problems they faced, and seeing all of that also helped me in my other roles, like with MBC or with MAP, where we try to advocate, try to influence policy. And then um, last year, I was honored to be appointed as part of the Private Sector Advisory Council. And that has allowed me to work more closely with government to try to figure out how do we bring our country forward? What are the barriers, for example, to investment? What are the things holding us back as a country? Why are investors bypassing us for Vietnam, for China? You know, finding the answers to those questions and finding the, trying to find the solutions, I think has been really very, very fulfilling for me. Those are existential questions yes. with uh, really tough answers to, mm -hmm. to secure. But you, you mentioned that it's, it's been interesting, it's a broad spread. But are you finding that you're more of a listener or do you contribute? I mean, I would presume that you're probably one of the youngest as an independent <laughs> board. Yeah, actually, surprisingly, <laughs> I tend to be on, on the younger side in the boards. Uh, there was a time I think I was the youngest. But um, so I, I think it would be in the middle. I'm a, I listen because there's a lot to learn from others, especially the more senior members of the board who've been there for a while and with their vast amount of experience. But being my age also ends up, uh, I also end up having other people listen to me because of the experience that I have behind me. So I tend to be somewhere in the middle. And you find that as a plus. Um, and, and given that you're, you're, you're a woman mm -hmm. in, as an independent director, are you finding that there's a better balance now between men and women? And you're, you're smiling there but because only because and I'm looking at the World Economic Forum's gender gaps index yes. but this this one goes back 
well into 2017. So mm. things might have changed. It says that even as Filipino women top the region when it comes to senior management roles, the question still remains on the relatively small representation of women in Philippine boards. That's correct. There really it still are. Uh, it, there's still a smaller number, but what I have found in the companies that I'm in, there definitely is a very proactive effort to find other women to put on the boards, and. It's not easy right now because there's a certain profile that they look for. Generally, they look for people who run large companies, who have experience overseas, who have certain um, expertise levels or certain areas of expertise. And perhaps because historically there haven't been that many female CEOs, it's a little harder to find women with that kind of profile. Same as the men, it's the same profile they look for in males. But I think that will change because you see so many female leaders now. And even when you look at large companies, you mentioned BPI and Ayala Corp, a lot of the next level potential CEO successors are female. And you see that in many industries. In fact, I think there was a PSA study that showed that at the senior levels, there are actually more females than men, females than males in the Philippines, and they're paid more. That's from the Philippine Statistics Authority. <laughs> and this proverbial glass ceiling of a break where we're not just talking about the senior management roles, but them getting elevated mm -hmm. into the board setting as an independent director, perhaps. Yes. And just looking at the securities in exchange uh, mandate, because the Philippines really doesn't have any government mandate when it comes to women on boards. There mm -hmm. is a recommendation, yes. But it's not a mandate, as it is in the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, this was just released in 2015. It did encourage the election of at least one female mm -hmm. independent director because that's aligned with the ASEAN corporate governance scorecard. But are you finding that there are more blue chip companies that are right now building that bench? You did make a mention mm -hmm. that there are a lot of women yes. in senior management roles, but are they across industries? Because you just mentioned that it was in banking, that you found that there are um, yes. a huge number, mm -hmm. but are they replicated in other industries? I think so. Even in Sun Life, for example, even when I was there, it was already 50-50 across the board. And you see that in financial services, certainly. There might be some which are more male than female, like mining, uh, manufacturing might be more male than female. but. Even in the oil industry, which is heavily male-dominated, you now have a female CEO of Shell Philippines. So there's, we're getting there, I think. We're getting there. And um, as to mandatory representation of women in boards, I've never actually really believed in that. Because I've always felt that women will naturally rise to the top. If the company is gender blind, if you select the very best people for the job, naturally you're going to have women and i've found that in the companies like i said earlier it's not that they don't want women directors they're actively trying very hard to find them it's just that because of the historical lack of uh, women at the top levels they haven't been able to to find them i wanted to pick up on what you just said because it, it really zeroes in and shattering that that not not only glass ceiling but the mindset mm -hmm. because you you have a different mindset. And, and if I can quote an earlier interview that you did, you said that you never thought of it being any different, referring to gender diversity, yes. being a woman uh, in the corporate world, because you are a Filipina or a woman, and you never felt disadvantaged because you were either. Mm -hmm. Take us through that mindset, because mm -hmm. a lot of us would want to fight for women in leadership roles, but you just kind of coasted along. <laughs> that kind of a mindset. Yeah, I, you know what I've found dealing with male colleagues is that if you don't think of yourself as female, they don't think of you as female either. And I don't mean that in a derogatory manner. They just see you as a colleague. So if you don't expect to be treated any differently because you're female, they won't treat you any differently. And uh, I've perhaps been lucky too because I've worked for companies that have been gender blind. We always promoted whoever was the best. For example, in Sun Life, at some point, we said the application form had to be revised. 
we were not allowed to ask any questions which could be taken to be discriminatory. So no questions on gender, age, religion, because you had to assess people based on purely their merit, purely on merit, purely based on their qualification. And that's worked really well. That's why we end up always with 50-50, because if you say you put the very best people in the job, then you really end up 50-50. Has Regen. that carried on? Yes. The application form is mm -hmm. still gender blind as it yes. is? Yes, it is. At this point in gender diversity, that just that takes us to to an either or situation because some people think of it as an advocacy, but others think of it as some kind of a policy interest. Mm -hmm. How do you see gender diversity in the corporate setting? Is it either or or should it be both? Both an advocacy and policy interest. You know, there have been numerous studies that show that diversity in a company results in better company performance. Okay? Um, com companies, the teams, diverse teams are more innovative. They're better able to handle complex situations. They're more resilient. Okay? They provide better insights to the company because of that diversity of thinking. So, I don't really think it's an either or. And one thing we have to remember, gender isn't just male or female. We have to really be gender blind in the sense that you will hire them even if they're transgender, even if they're gay. And we have some of the very best employees we've had have been precisely that. And I think that allows you to get the very best people in the jobs and to get the very best performance when people know that they're being assessed purely on their performance on their merit and not on anything, not based on anything else. Let's talk about that broad spread that, that now is presented before you with your membership in various uh, companies. Uh, you're, you're in manufacturing, banking, property, renewable energy, food, and healthcare even, among yeah. others. How does that inform you of the corporates here in the Philippines as a whole, post-pandemic? Mm -hmm. I've found that the corporates during the pandemic and after, have been far more conscious of uh, their various stakeholders. The needs of the employees, for example. You have companies now that are adjusting their policies to allow full work from home because they don't want to lose their employees. People's values changed because of the pandemic. They realized that some things were more important to them than others. Some people decided to just go home to the province and work from there and be with family. So companies became much more conscious of things like that, of uh, employees. In fact, the whole idea of stakeholder capitalism, I think, was really highlighted in the pandemic because they had to take care of their employees, yes, but they also had to take care of their clients. Maybe grace periods, you saw that with the banks, right? Credit card bills, you were given 60 days grace period to pay it. Same with insurance, they gave longer grace periods to the clients to pay. You saw it with the way they treated their suppliers and vendors. Companies who would advance the payments to the suppliers to keep their suppliers functioning. Because w what happens if you lose all your suppliers? You won't be able to produce your products. You saw real estate companies, the mall operators, waiving the lease payments of their tenants. Because what happens when the pandemic ends? If you have no more tenants in your mall, nobody's going to come. So that whole idea of we got to take care of the whole system, not just our shareholders, not just ourselves. You got to take care of everyone. And I saw that in practically every company on whose board I sat. So everybody became a little kinder to everybody. I think so. But, I think but so. how is that carrying on right now with the return to mobility and the fact that we're facing uh, pandemic, post-pandemic inflation, high interest rates? I mean, this is like throwing us back into a pre-pandemic scenario. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to be kind or just as kind as we were during the pandemic, but things got to change. Mm -hmm. So how do you think corporates are managing that? I think corporates are realizing also you can't go back. Okay. That's why you have the BPO industry now asking to be allowed to work 100% from home because otherwise they're going to lose a lot of their employees. So you can't go back. And, um, and I think that realization that you have to take care of the whole ecosystem because that's what will keep you functioning, profitable, well into the future. 
I've always said, even long ago, that if you're unable to bring the bottom of the pyramid up, you know, the communities around you, then progress will stop because where will your clients of the future come from if you're unable to move the country forward? So, Net Net, do you think it's been good or bad for the consumer? How are you seeing it from that bottom of the pyramid? I think it's been difficult, obviously, because jobs were lost, not because people wanted to terminate them, but because if a company wasn't earning anything, how could you keep your employees? And I did see a lot of companies go the extra mile to try to keep their employees, even at the expense of profit to the owners. Um, so it's been difficult for consumers and we've been struggling with the impact of the pandemic, inflation because of supply chain disruptions, and then the geopolitical issues that came in with Russia, Ukraine, and so on. So, but I think net-net, it's probably gonna be better for the consumer moving forward because you discover your power as a consumer to demand to be treated the way you want to be treated. Um, ESG issues, for example, have come much more to the fore. There are a lot of surveys showing that even in the Philippines, I was surprised, majority of people would be willing to pay a little bit more if the product is more sustainable. Okay. Because they see the impact of, of uh, not taking care of the environment. You get the pandemic that shuts down the entire economy or you get a typhoon that damages your entire community. So people are more conscious, I think, of that. And since it's consumer-led, that's the North Star. Mm -hmm. I mean, there it is. I mean, either you listen to the consumer or you don't, and you lose the business. You mentioned jobs and that you're a member of the Private Sector Advisory Council yes. with your focus really on jobs. And you're coming at a time that jobs have been lost. Yes. Could you baseline for us the situation when it comes to employment? Because we did get some statistics that unemployment and employment rate are among the best in about 17 mm -hmm. years or since 2015. Yes. This is what the data show. And this is also what's been said at the State of the Nation mm -hmm. uh, address. An underemployment rate among the lowest, the best since record keeping began in the 90s. But still, it's at double digits. Mm -hmm. But could you take us through your own journey of finding out where we are and where we're at at this point and how do you see us moving forward? Yeah, I think the employment rates have been good uh, as already mentioned, but what I've seen is that a lot of people while employed have taken jobs that are lower than their original jobs. For example, people who are in managerial positions now taking lower level jobs just to stay employed. Okay, so the the, I don't know if that's considered as part of underemployment, but I would consider that as being underemployed, right? So, so the quality of the jobs, I think, is what has gone down. And that's been shown also by, I think it was the World Bank or one of these other studies, that while the number of jobs has increased, the quality of the jobs has gone down. And what we really want to focus on, aside from generating more jobs is how do we generate jobs that are higher up the value chain? Because the BPO industry, for one, is under threat at the moment from AI because of all, all these developments of generative AI. And some of the developments are really amazing and they're very well aware of it. And they're trying to see how to upskill their personnel. So that's gonna be a big thrust moving forward. How do we upskill our workforce? And countries are spending huge amounts on this. Singapore has a voucher system where everybody has a voucher for you to be able to enroll and upskill at the government expense. India formed the Skills Corporation, National Skills Corporation, whose aim is to upskill. They want India to be the skills capital of the world. And 15 million people have already gone through the training provided by that. Where are we, right? So that's one of the things that uh, we brought to the attention of the president. And, and um, you know, fortunately, one of the things we're happy about is he's been very receptive to it. So we're right now in the process of trying to figure out what mechanisms do we need to put in place to upscale our workforce? So where does it start? If we're asking that question now, what are the mechanisms? Do we start with the private sector? Do we do it with government? How? I think it's got to be a public-private partnership. PPPs, when people think of PPPs, they always think of infrastructure. But there are other forms of PPP, and this is one. Partnering on education and 
skills development and upskilling. So we have, uh, I think government has acknowledged that knowing what skills are required is really, what, it's a private sector that knows that, right? The people who can do the training are with the private sector. So how do we harness all of that? So we put together a mechanism to harness that so that there's a structured way of going through what are the skills needed. The various industries, perhaps we form skills councils that can determine these are the skills we need. These are the training requirements. This is how we can do it. And then we work with government for certification, for uh, ensuring that the training is of the standard that's required. You know, we bring in TESDA, DTI. So we've been working with all the various government departments and agencies precisely on that. And then of course there's investments you need to generate uh, when it comes to job generation. We need to bring in investments into the country. So that's the baseline. I mean, I'm thinking about the time pre-pandemic. Um, it's it's the ongoing refrain when you talk to BPO executives. It's really upskilling, reskilling, mm -hmm. because people will lose their jobs. Yeah. Have we progressed beyond that point? And now that we're talking about generative AI, are we even ready for that? Yes. So um, I think personally. And this is from a non-scientific basis. I haven't. Uh, I think we're not quite where we should be. We're not quite ready. Um, perhaps we should be moving a little bit faster. Because certainly, if you look at Vietnam, you look at other countries, the skills development there has just been so much more structured. When you ask investors, what are the concerns about the investing in the Philippines? Number one is ease of doing business, right? Number two is skills. Okay. Ease of doing business, we know all of that, the, the problems with the number of steps, how slow everything is, the lack of digital facilities. But number two is skills. They said, the skills we need are just not present. So they go to the Vietnams and the, you know, other country, Thailands. So when the, in that move away from China, we weren't able to capture any of that. No Which is really such from, a pity, From the right? time that we created the Anti-Red Tape Authority, I would have no. thought that probably that would have cut back the number of permits and the process itself. To be fair, the Anti-Red Tape Authority has been um, doing its job in trying to speed things up, but it's just so many things that you have to look at across all the industries that I guess it takes time. And sometimes whoever screams the loudest <laughs> gets the <laughs> attention, right? So we really need to cut the red tape. And a lot of the red tape happens at the LGU level too. We need to streamline the processes because you work in one LGU, then you go to a different LGU and the rules are different. So especially if you're a foreign company, how do you make sense of it all, right? So we need to streamline perhaps to standardize to, to really cut the red tape because a lot of things like opening a new business, you go to New Zealand, half a day you can do it. Here it takes months just to open a new company. So in a world that's moving so quickly, how do you compete when you're moving at a glacial pace? And part of it is digitalization because they can do almost everything online elsewhere. But here you need to go through paper, file here, file there. It's a lot more difficult. <laughs> and that's not even where we're at even before we got talking about uh, the slow processes, we were talking about upskilling and reskilling, which takes us back to education because mm -hmm. there's a strong link there. If you want yes. the jobs of the future today, you got to tap into the educational system. Mm -hmm. But what are you seeing? What should change right now to capture the jobs of the future at mm -hmm. PSAC? Yeah. So for, for me, if you look at what do I think we should focus on in the next year? What do you think the administration should focus on? For me, number one is human capital development. Our human capital and education is top of mind. We need to raise the standards for our education system. You know all the stats about being at the bottom, right? All the science tests, math tests, we're at the bottom, okay? We need to raise our standards, education. And because how do you even start talking about AI and machine learning? and all of that when your math skills aren't there. So that's, that's really of primary importance. Improve the education system. 
make it more suitable to what industry needs. And that's working with industry. What skills are actually needed? Where do you need to focus, especially at the senior high and college levels? So educational system. But the other one that I think uh, is also important is healthcare, okay? And, uh, and food security. Why? Because you can't think when your brain is stunted. And the level of uh, malnutrition in our country now is very high. It's very hard, you know, it's very hard to teach kids that can't, that, don't, that can't even think properly or have hungry stomachs, right? But the problem is with, with malnutrition, with stunting, something like a third of our children now are malnourished. 25% have stunted development. And once they reach five years old, that's permanent. Your brain development is already impacted. Healthcare, we saw the impact during the pandemic of uh, it, lack of healthcare, right? You resort to dra drastic lockdowns because your hospitals won't be able to handle the surge in, uh, in cases. So taking care of human capital, education, healthcare, food security will have the biggest long-term impact on the Philippines. It will determine how competitive we will be in the future, how well we will do as a nation 20, 30 years down the road. And in 2019, a World Bank study showed that given the, the level of stunting, malnutrition, healthcare that we had then, Filipinos would only be 52% as productive as they otherwise would have been as adults if they had had the proper healthcare and stunting. So yes, education is important, but you also need, you know, they said healthy mind, healthy body, healthy mind. You'd also need that. You made a mention of the courses needed to, to ensure that we're training kids for the future. Do any courses come to mind? Have you gone to that level of detail? Perhaps um, STEM courses that, mm -hmm. would, that would probably be a good start for the educational system? Yeah. Well, not in the PSAC, but for the educational system, really important, I think, are STEM courses. That's correct because if you look at all the jobs of the future, probably 90% of the jobs don't exist today. But there'll be in areas like data analytics, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of that, their foundation is math. But the other one that's going to be really important is critical thinking. And that's developed through the humanities courses. You develop your critical thinking by you know, philosophy and all of those other things. So it's important that, yes, we focus on STEM, but don't forget the other courses because it's important to develop those critical thinking skills. Indeed, the soft skills. The uh, soft the skills. The EQ, developing the emotional quotient in this very digital age, very important. I wanted to pick your brains now on insurance as sure. that's that's up your alley. Uh, but then when I look at the penetration rate, it's it's quite depressing because it's still below 3%. When you so compare 1.72%. Is it? It's even lower than 3%. And that's that's pretty dire when you compare that with the other ASEAN neighbors mm -hmm. yes. where it's double digit uh, in terms of um, reach. And mm -hmm. insurance is so important because it, it goes into financial inclusion and really helping the impoverished get access mm -hmm. to, to financing, to insurance. Could you talk us through the, the reason why it's been a sticky 1.7 percent? Yes. yes. Singapore is 10 percent of GDP. Mm. Ours were, like you said, it was stuck at 1.7 thereabouts. One is really financial literacy. It remains pretty low in the country, um, which is also why banks, uh, a lot of people haven't, we still have a lot of unbanked, right? Financial literacy is pretty low. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I need to buy insurance. So there has to be a really conscious effort on the part of companies to educate the population, to try to increase that financial literacy level. Disposable income has been increasing, and we really are at the level already where insurance starts to take off. But that's really been the bigger issue, lack of financial literacy. Now, having said that, well, that's a, it seems very um, depressing, it's also a cause for optimism because that means there's a lot of room to grow. When you look at Singapore at 10%, Thailand at 3.4, you see that there's really, 
you know, you could easily double insurance uh, penetration in the country in terms of uh, um, percentage com uh, premiums or income compared to GDP. So there's a lot of uh, room for growth. And I think while the insurance industry has been growing in the past years, you will see that growth continue. But it's also an industry that's ripe for disruption. Very ripe for disruption because here it's still largely paper-based, right? In other countries, you already see online application, underwriting using a selfie. Okay? And then they ask you questions dynamically, AI-driven, based on your answers. You see policies being issued in 90 minutes. Sorry, 90 minutes, 90 seconds, not minutes. You see, so you see all these um, changes happening and local companies will have to adapt. And I think the industry has been a bit slow to go digital. Um, in the pandemic, it probably accelerated, but we really have to move faster because the whole industry is ripe for disruption. You know, I would have thought that the industry would have been fast-tracked by the fact that people might seek more life insurance mm -hmm. during a pandemic because it's taken away so many lives. And the only way to assure a life is to insure it. Mm -hmm. But you didn't see that well, in the past three years? That I think kind of the consciousness. realization of the need. Yes, I think that realization, there was some of that realization of the need. But the other problem was affordability too. For mm -hmm. some, they, you know, people think of insurance as you buy it when you have disposable income. They don't see it as a necessity, when in reality, it is a necessity. You should be buying insurance before you buy in investments or before you invest your money because it's more important that you protect what you have than, than you grow But maybe it, right? we're talking about the de different demographic here. I mean, if, if it was a Gen Z, mm -hmm. they'd probably think about spending it on travel and food. A millennial probably would think about buying a house and buying insurance. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we're kind of stuck in that demographic where uh, we still have to mine that opportunity? Mm -hmm. And or is it a fact that it's really just those who have already earned a lot of money who think about insuring themselves mm -hmm. with life insurance? Yeah, I think it's, it's more the latter, I think. I think the really uh, the among the young people, the consciousness of uh, the need to insure I think it's rising because certainly before I retired, we found an increasing percentage of younger clients, both in insurance and investments. But um, for a lot of work, especially the pandemic where people lost jobs, for some it became, okay, I'll insure myself when I have more money. But right now I have to take care of my food, my rent, my kids' education. So they, they look at basic things first before they think of how to protect their future. It, it's a mindset of protect my present before I think of protecting my future. Interesting that you mentioned before you stepped aside as, as chief of Sun Life, you've seen that growth in, mm -hmm. in the young taking an interest. It happened really at an interesting time because Sun Life grew its premium income by 250%. Mm -hmm. Client base tripled to 3.6 million. So yes. by the time you stepped aside, Sun Life became number one in mm -hmm. the insurance industry. I'm wondering what sort of a backdrop encouraged that kind of performance that might be compared to what we're seeing now as a recovery phase for the economy that mm -hmm. might also mean good for the insurance industry. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting that you say that because when I was appointed CEO 2009, it was right after the global financial yes, crisis. So we were in a very similar situation. Premiums hadn't been growing for the last 10 years. The K year was like 1% for the industry. So people were actually asking me, is this a dying industry? But what we did then was we started to think of how do we get to the targets that were given to us, which nearly made me fall off my seat <laughs> at that time. How do we get there? And we realized you couldn't do it by doing the th same things that we used to do. Like Einstein said, right? Insanity is doing the th same things over and over again, expecting a different result. So we started trying different things. Um, we started with the financial literacy campaign because we realized the level of literacy was so low. We started doing advertising, which everybody said didn't work for insurance, but it, it turns out it did. It raised the profile of the company so much that our advisors were telling us, our salespeople, 
whereas previously they had to sell the company before they could sell the product to the client. Now when they go, at that time, when they go to the client, the client would say, oh, Sunlight, yes, I know Sunlight. Okay, and there were actually people saying, clients were phoning them asking, I want to buy a product. So that raising of public consciousness of the need to buy insurance really helped drive that growth. So it was doing things differently, trying things that hadn't been tried before, and building the company culture. Okay. That was really important to, to drive that growth. Now we're at another maybe inflection point where you know, the, the thing with the crisis is you see realignments in the industry and opportunities for those here to leapfrog. But it also means, okay, now what do we do differently to get to the next level? I think that's where companies are at now trying to figure out what do we need to do differently? And most people say it probably has to do with digital. How do we utilize digital to bring us to the next level? How do we use digital to reach out to a much larger audience? You know, we've been trying to figure that out for years previously. And we try one thing after another, but we haven't quite hit on the solution. Maybe now somebody will. Indeed, that is becoming more mature and a lot more people are accepting of at least the terms AI, ML, machine learning, mm -hmm. which takes us to digital tools because you're, you're involved in insurance that's already going into automation as you are in digital banking, mm -hmm. uh, which also deals with financial inclusion. But then comes the problem of underserved and the underserved markets that you now have to focus on. What are you doing now as, as part of a board that, that has the capability to, to help include those people that have not yet been served through traditional banking? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a, that's a question that I think no one quite knows the answer to yet. People are experimenting. You see traditional banks moving into digital banking heavily right now moving things to digital platform. And I think there was this statistic that came out of the BSP that something like close to half of payments are now through digital channels, which is good, right? They want to encourage that. But at the same time, because of the low financial literacy, people aren't just going to go and buy a, a product through a digital channel because they don't quite understand. So even the digital banks, I think, are finding that while clients are willing to transact with you digitally afterwards, the initial onboarding of the client often needs a human, even if not to sell to them, but to just help them through, you know, entering your information, getting a selfie taken. It still needs a human. Same as in life insurance. While digital channels are available, the bulk, the vast majority of sales are still coming from financial advisors, from agents and salespeople, because the financial literacy is low. So the trust in the system isn't quite there. So they need to be able to get some reassurance. And it's hard to get reassurance from a machine, <laughs> but you can get the reassurance from talking to a person. So, so I think that that's, uh, that's part of it and why the inclusion isn't there yet, because the onboarding still needs people. So digital channels hold great promise, I think, for financial inclusion. But we need to continue to develop the business models to figure out how do you onboard them to begin with um, in, an, in a more cost-effective manner, for one. It's an interesting point you make because you're also part of a traditional bank, the third largest private bank, BPI, and you've recently filled the 15th board seat mm -hmm. and the sixth independent director. That kind of gives you an idea that uh, the traditional banking system might, might kind of work out when it comes to onboarding more people because, because this is how they know. Mm -hmm. This is what they trust, mm -hmm. how they know how to, how to maybe invest in something. Are you seeing some kind of a bridging of that gap between traditional banks and digital banking mm -hmm. for people to be more accepting mm -hmm. and to be more financially literate in the end? I think so. Um, I think the pandemic certainly accelerated that. You saw more people shift to online, even among, I mean, just an anecdote, even among neighbors. In the beginning, nobody knew how to pay using bank transfers, um, older neighbors. 
by the end of the pandemic, everybody knew how to do it, how to uh, how to do online transfers, how to use GCash. You saw the tremendous growth, 70 million plus users. Whereas formerly, people who would only use cash or checks, the beginning of the pandemic, I remember having to collect checks for the fund drives we had for feeding the communities around us. Later on, it was just all GCash. So you'll see that bridging. I think, again, because of the poor financial literacy, traditional banking will be around for some time. But you see all the traditional banks also moving to digital. We see them um, starting to really build up their digital channels. Even BPI, which is often thought of as a very traditional, staid, um, you know, old bank, is actually, I've found, very forward-looking. They're investing a lot in the digital channels because they anticipate that it's going to continue growing in the future. So you see that, I think, for now, traditional banking will be still primary, but you see, you're seeing that shift really to digital, and I think they'll complement each other. You know, the last time we talked, I think your kids were still in school mm -hmm. and taking an interest in STEM, but I know that they've finished school, and uh, Tina, Jiho, and Ino yes. are all in, in very interesting jobs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which we talked about just a few minutes ago, yeah. involved in, in the digital sphere. Yes. Yeah. So is Tina, that something that came naturally to them? Yes, it, it was. It was from uh, mom's prodding. No, no. <laughs> One of the things my husband and I never did was tell them what to do because they would never listen anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, my daughter Tina, she's in the U.S. She works for Apple, and she manages an engineering team. So she does really interesting stuff. The latest product of Apple, that Apple Vision, the virtual reality stuff, she worked on that. Oh. So she's also worked on their M1 chips, M2, and so on. She's in chip design. So if you have an Apple product, ch chances are she's worked on it. Wow. That's, uh, that's my daughter. And uh, another, the second one, the son, is uh, he's in finance. So he's working for a VC. So it's really interesting to talk, when I, when I chat with him, venture capital, mm -hmm. yes. Because of the interesting companies that they assess and, uh, you know, looking at, it's, it's just an entirely different world from what we're used to. And the youngest one is a data scientist. He actually works for a, for a foreign company, but they have a very interesting model. Their employees are all over the world. So his boss is in Latin America, his project manager is in Paris, his, you know, things like that. And he's one of the lead data scientists here in the, the Philippines. They do very interesting stuff in AI, machine learning, machine vision. Stuff that I have no clue about <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but you get up to speed because the kids are in it. You made a mention of Chicho, your husband. Yes. And I know that um, he was a CEO before you uh, got into the helm of Sun Life. So you got a lot of support, a lot of advice from him. But you also had that strategic advantage, knowing that your husband supported you mm -hmm. any which way you went. Yes. What was that like in the whole mix of having to rise um, in your career journey, as well as raise kids. So that has been maybe my secret weapon. <laughs> <laughs> a very supportive uh, husband has been very important because I was never afraid to do the right thing. I was never afraid to lose my job because I said if I ever lost my job because of a decision I made, I'd rely on my <laughs> husband to support me for a while. And that's what, that's what I used to joke all the time. But, but it really, having a supportive husband was really for me, quite an advantage. Because even in raising our kids, he was you know, very chill about it. If I couldn't go to an event at school or pick up the report card, he'd say, okay, I'll do it. You know, whereas others would say, no, you do that. In his case, no, he was very supportive. So that, that really helped. <laughs> do you run as much in those major marathons? I, I still remember you did your first. And, and if I'm not mistaken, it's four hours and 46 minutes. Yes. And you did it when you were 51. Yes. Not too long ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't, uh, the pandemic, unfortunately, mm -hmm. also closed all the areas where I used to do long runs. So I haven't really been doing long runs. I'm actually joining my first race since the pandemic started, week after next, the uh, Sunday after this coming Sunday. But it's just 10 kilometers. Oh, that's a good start. Is it just going to be here or overseas? No, it's here in UP. Oh, nice. 
So we said, okay, let's join and let's see. Probably going to be a lot slower than I used to be, <laughs> but that's fine. I'm also a lot older than I used to be. But what was it like, if you remember, uh, the finer details of running four hours and 46 minutes? And at that time, you were still CEO of Sun Life. Mm -hmm. So you were running two things, running the marathons in the company. Yes. Well, you know, running a marathon for me, in a way, complemented being a CEO because it instills discipline in you. You know you have to train because you're not going to be ready for the marathon otherwise. So I had a schedule really and I stuck to it as best as I could. If I could avoid early morning meetings, I would so I could run. And wherever I was in the world, I ran. You know, I've run on the deck of a ship for two hours round wow. and round because I had to. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine running around the deck? I've run in below zero temperature with snow on the ground. I've run in strange places where I couldn't understand the signs in China, you know, almost got lost in Japan. <laughs> so it instills that discipline knowing that if, you're, if you don't do what you're supposed to, you won't be ready, you won't be able to do it. And it's the same in the workplace, right? You do what you have to on schedule because otherwise you'll never get it done when you're supposed to. Unfortunately, some people try to leave things until the last minute, right? And it also helped me deal with the stress of the job because, you know, exercise is really, it was really important. I said earlier, healthy body, healthy mind. It really helped me cope with the stress, be able to exercise, be able to, when you're running, just not think of anything except running. It was my me time. It's almost like meditation, except you're running. So Before we wrap, uh, could you give us maybe some, some gems of advice for those out there, knowing that you had been a programmer of a computer company who got promoted to being CEO of a really huge company. I mean, that's not the typical route of mm -hmm. IT a person becoming the CEO, but you did. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give those who well, want to trailblaze like you did? First, I'd say say yes to everything. Everything? Now that may sound strange. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really mean that literally say yes to everything, but keep your mind open to all the possibilities. I've taken on jobs that nobody wanted. I, w I got assigned job, do this, and it's nobody wanted it, and I did it. And then later on, I found out that it actually helped me in a future job that I had to do or a future role that I had to do, especially now where you don't know what's going to happen in the future. The world is changing so rapidly that you just don't know. The industry you're in today might be on top and then tomorrow it's gone. Said so Like I said, 90% of the jobs of the future probably don't exist today. So when an opportunity opens up, take it. Don't be afraid, even if you don't have the skill for it. When I was appointed CEO, I didn't think I was ready. But take it and then um, do the very best that you can. You'll find later on that you eventually connect the dots. Yeah, I did this, I did this, nobody wanted it. And, oh yeah, now it's helping me do this. Or oh yes, this turns out this is the job of the future. The other one I would say is strive for excellence, not success. To me, success, and I've always said this, success is an outcome of excellence. When you strive for success, sometimes you do the wrong things. But when you strive for excellence, then, you know, excellence begets success. Even when we were, um, when I was a new CEO, when we said we had to meet these targets, we never aimed to be number one. What we wanted was to be the very best at what we did, provide the best products, best customer service, have the best sales force, most productive sales force. And by doing all of that, we found two years later, we were number one. The number one is an outcome. It's not a goal. So success is an outcome, not a goal. So strive for excellence, not success. And maybe third is be rooted in your values because you really find out that it's so easy to get lost when you're trying to rise, when you're trying to meet targets. But your values are going to determine how you act in the future. I remember once one of our top advisors came to me. We were really struggling then, we were trying to hit targets. And she had a 300 million peso policy that she could bring in. 
And she said, it was just a bit of a problem. The client couldn't meet some of the requirements that we wanted. And I said, she was asking me, can you please waive those requirements? So I thought about it and I said, no, I couldn't waive those requirements because they were really necessary for various reasons. And then she told me, come on, sig -sig na. she said, nobody will ever know. This is just between us. Nobody will ever know, I said. But the problem is you know, I told her, and you will forever be wondering whether I'm also doing this for other people. So if you want to build a culture of trust in an organization, you've got to be consistent in your actions and you've got to be values driven. And I found that I've gone through periods where for three months, someone wouldn't talk to me because I wouldn't agree, I wouldn't accede to their request. But eventually, people realize that when you're objective, you're fair, then they're driven to perform more because they know now there's a level playing field and the trust is built. Trust comes from the accumulation of all your actions and interactions with other people. And when the trust is there, when they trust you to do what's right, they're more likely to follow you as a leader when you ask them to do something. In hindsight, it's always 2020. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Inspiring words, Riza. And good luck on the run. Thank you. <laughs> I need it. Thank you. And catch us again next Tuesday at 9 p.m. Manila time on One News. You can also check out the long conversation on Spotify, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. I'm Kathy Yang, and this is Thought Leaders.